from St. Louis Public Radio. This is the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jason Rosenbaum. Missouri Congresswoman Cori Bush is no stranger to confronting powerful political and civic institutions. After all, Bush challenged and eventually defeated Congressman Lacey Clay in 2020, and before that became well known in St. Louis for her time in the protest movement that arose after Michael Brown's death in Ferguson. Now Bush is facing another challenge on August 6th. He's trying to outflank St. Louis County Prosecutor Wesley Bell and former State Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal in a nationally watched contest for Missouri's first congressional district seat. Joining us now is Congresswoman Cori Bush, who represents all the city of St. Louis and parts of St. Louis County in the U.S. House. Congresswoman, welcome to the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. Thanks for having me again, Jason. So you have not always seen eye to eye with President Biden, and now some of your colleagues are calling on him to leave the presidential race. Do you think that he should remain the Democratic nominee? So right now, just like with everything else that we do, um, we're listening to what the community is saying. We're monitoring the calls that are coming into our office and um, to the St. Louis office as well as the D.C. office on what our constituents are saying they want to see um, and what how they want me to approach this. So I have not come out publicly for or against. Um, I am I've had talks, been in talks with leadership, been in talks with our Democratic caucus, um, as we've all probably seen and heard play out over the last week. Um, there have been multiple conversations from the uh, the Congressional Black Caucus to the full Democratic caucus and many others. And so now I, I will say, though, that up to this point, and maybe this will help us to get other calls in too, but up to this point, 100% of the calls into our office has been um, asking me to ask the president to not run in the in, um, uh, in the election for president for um, the next uh, term. So, um, but we're still listening. Do you think he can win? Uh, if the, you know, if the Biden campaign if they're listening to what the voters are saying, actually listening and making the structural changes needed to be able to um, to push a win. And also it's up to if that message resonates, if we if the Democratic Party, we have to make sure that the message is getting out. And uh, that has been something that we've talked about for a long time. So let's get to your campaign. If I had to boil down the argument against your reelection, it's this. Your detractors contend you put a lot of energy into advocating for issues that you care about, but you haven't been able to achieve significant policy results or bring back significant policy wins to St. Louis. Why are they wrong? They're wrong, first of all, because uh, I walked in the door. My third day in office was the insurrection. Um, so that is the that is the that has been the climate of this Congress. Even though um, when I walked in, the House uh, we we did have um, the Democrats did have the House, the Senate, and the um, the presidency, but we were in a House where there was um, a big rift between um, pushing President Biden's agenda um, and then pushing an agenda that was uh, a little more to the right of President Biden. And so there was a lot of push and pull. But we did have we did have wins. You know, um, we pushed for amendments, uh, uh, amendments that would bring forth signage for Coldwater Creek, something that had been people. uh, The advocates have been pushing for for 30 years. We were finally able to get that get uh, a bill passed to do that. We um, 25 pieces of of legislation we were able to pass through the House. Um, I have uh, in some of my bills, actually, because they weren't able to pass through both houses, the president folded them into executive order. So um, in his executive order. So like like what, for example, like like for for one um, that I'm really, really proud of is the um, environmental data uh, mapping, uh, uh, data mapping and justice act. So this particular uh, bill. We understand that Justice 40, that making sure that the communities that need the investment um, to fight climate, the climate crisis is important. But how do we make sure that those communities get that direct investment and they get enough of what's needed? So that so I, I, I along with Senator Markey, we decided to put forth a who's, uh, a, a, re- who's a senator from Massachusetts. A senator from Massachusetts. Yeah. So um, so Senator Markey and I, we worked on a bill to go ahead and. 
um, put together an algorithm for the administration to be able to use to make sure that they have something to uh, a, a, a guide. And the president really liked our really liked our bill. And so he made sure that that bill um, uh, was able to move forward. So you have uh, put out publicly that you have delivered two billion dollars yes. to the St. Louis region. And I got a spreadsheet from your office. A large percentage of that is for your yes vote for the American Rescue Plan, which brought in hundreds of millions of dollars to St. Louis and St. Louis County. And again, your detractors would say you're trying to conflate money your office personally secures through the earmarking process, which you have direct control with, with something like the American Rescue Plan, which is usually done by a formula or is directed by the executive branch where you don't have direct control. What would you say to that contention? I would say that they are wrong. Okay. And I would say that they are wrong because so the uh, prior to the American Rescue Plan, there was the CARES Act. Um uh, we received a little less than uh, a little less than forty billion um, through the CARES Act um, under Donald Trump. When I took office, when the American Rescue Plan was on the table, our office decided to read the whole bill. And in the bill, it speaks about the algorithm, and we understood that the algorithm would not, it, you know, it just didn't seem like it would give St. Louis the investment that it needed. And actually, I got some of the idea from um, from our mayor, Tashara Jones, from her father, Vervis. Um, and so we went and we looked at the algorithm and then our office worked with the committee and through the Treasury to um, to make changes to that algorithm so that St. Louis to get a different investment, a bigger investment, because it's what was needed. And so instead of getting under 40 million like we received before, 500 million for St. Louis City and 200, 100 and uh, uh, a little under uh, 200 million for St. Louis County. I think that's a big difference. This race is getting a lot of national attention, primarily because of the assumption among national pundits that it will be a referendum on your criticism of Israel. To what extent do you think what is happening in Gaza will be a determinative factor to whether you win re-election or not? So the thing is, there is deceit happening right now. And that's what really upsets me about what's happening in this race. So if the reason why Wesley Bell decided to run for this seat, which initially he came out and said it was because I called for a ceasefire in Gaza um, and he accepted the endorsement of APAC, um, uh, which the, is, by, uh, the way, by the way, American is, Israel, Israel Public Affairs, Affairs Committee. Committee. Yes. And he has accepted their endorsement. They have a PAC called United Democracy Project, which so many of you um, have probably received many, many mailers and you've seen all the ads that is their that is APAC's political arm. He came out and said he's running against me because of that issue. Since then, he does not talk about that issue. Since then, United Democracy Project, the videos that they put out, all of the ads, none of them reference reference Gaza at all. So the thing is this, why are they not talking about that? Is it because the president, this is the president's position to, uh, of for a ceasefire now? Because the president says this is what he wants? And so the thing, and so I'm really pissed off that, that there is this deceit happening, because if you believe that's why you needed to run, then why aren't you running on that? Well, I have a theory. It's because there's both through polling and anecdotal evidence, i.e. me talking to black voters. It has been documented that African-American voters, which makes up a plurality of your district, yes. do not vote for somebody based off their positions on Israel. Right. And. I think that's why this race may be different than Jamal Bowman. Yes, is, Am I wrong on that? No, you are 100 percent right. And and in all of the conversations I've been having, that has been the that has been a constant. And so the thing is, well, then why did why? Why is, is he actually running? If your real reason for for running was because I call for a ceasefire, but that's not what you're running on, then you are deceiving the people run make your ads about Israel because that about about uh, about standing 100 percent with Israel if that's what you say because my because my stance is all people across this globe deserve safety we need to fight anti-semitism and and um, uh, anti-palestinian hate wherever wherever it arises so we need to stand with all people and that's not what this is and we're going to talk more about your ceasefire resolution yes. after the break. But I do want to ask this question. So you have painted APAC as this right wing extremist group. Yet yes. APAC has supported people like Hakeem Jeffries, who has endorsed you in this race and President Biden. So is it really fair to say that this group is consistently like supporting right wing Republicans when they have boosted a lot of 
liberal Democrat. Absolutely, because first of all, they 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 are the the biggest funder for uh, Democrats. They are also the biggest funder for Republicans, and they support more Republicans. The, and also their work in a Democratic district, they're looking to try to put someone in that leans more to the right. And so that makes a difference. So they don't care about it. Like in this race, they don't care about how much I've done to help support our unhoused community members. They don't care about the money that we were able to get to to places like Epworth to help our children and, and youth in need. They don't care about any of that. They don't care about that we were able to get millions of dollars for uh, St. Louis Housing Authority to make sure that our uh, our seniors had access to broadband. They don't care about those things. They care about making sure that they get someone who leans more to the right. And 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 I say that because... The mega donors, the same mega donors that are trying to um, elect Donald Trump are the same donors that are uh, supporting Wesley Bell in this race through um, through APAC. And let me say this too, Jason, APAC supports over 100 insurrectionist members of Congress. These are the election deniers that believe that Donald Trump actually won the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, presidential race back in 20 in uh, 2020. And so they support over 100 of those folks and they support over 200 anti-abortion lawmakers. So how is that better for St. Louis, someone that believes that scaling the walls of the Capitol was was OK? We're going to fund those folks. But again, they support Hakeem Jeffries. They too. do. They do support Hakeem Jeffries. And that is to me, that's the cover. We'll support a few of the Democrats. That's the cover. We'll support a few of the Democrats, but our real agenda is to make sure that we're getting uh, we're getting our Republicans that are pushing our agenda into these seats. We need to take a quick break, but we'll continue our conversation with Congresswoman Cori Bush when we come back. This is the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. Welcome back to the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jason Rosenbaum. We now return to our conversation with Congresswoman Cori Bush, a Democrat who represents Missouri's first congressional district. So in a press conference on Thursday, President Biden said the only way for a lasting peace is what's known as a two-state solution, which results in the establishment of an independent Palestinian state that is majority Muslim alongside an independent Israeli state that is majority Jewish. Do you share the, the desire among many of your Democratic colleagues, including the president, for a two-state solution? Um, so I have not come out public either way with a one-state or a two-state solution. I believe that um, the uh, Israelis have uh, should be safe and have a place to call home, as well as Palestinians should be safe and have a place to call home. Uh, I uh, the, And the reason why I have not come out publicly with a statement on that is because, for one— um, to be a lawmaker in another country, telling people in another country, this is how your country should, this is how your country or your land should be divided. Um, I don't believe that that is my place as the St. Louis congressperson, but I believe that making sure that there is safety for Israelis and Palestinians, um, and there is a place where there is um, uh, liberation and freedom for both is key. I do want to talk about your Jewish constituents mm -hmm. because there's a large amount and I've talked with, I have not talked to every Jewish person in the first district. Mm -hmm. I want to make that clear. And there's very different opinions. Yes. But we got a listener question. We got a lot of listener questions on this topic, including this one from former Creve Corps City Councilwoman Heather Silverman. Bush's actions have caused many Jews to understand that their congresswoman does not love them. Given that showing her constituents love was so much a part of her first campaign, what does she intend, if anything, to do about that? So I'll follow up on that question. What would you say to your Jewish constituents, even ones who are progressive and who have supported you in the past, who contend you didn't do enough to provide comfort to them after Hamas's October 7th attack? So I will say that I would love for them to be more specific, because one thing I've had many, many conversations with our um, Jewish community members, and it's just like in any community you can talk with 75 of these folks and then people will still say you didn't talk to this person or you didn't talk to this group or you didn't. So for us, we were talking to those that reached out to us. We were talking to those that we had contact with. We were putting out uh, putting out information 
And uh, and then also one thing that was happening was people were saying, oh, well, she didn't do this because on social media it said that she didn't do this. Well, you know, they said, oh, well, she doesn't support releasing the hostages. I actually co-sponsored the bill to release the hostages. You know, I um, oh, she didn't condemn Hamas. I condemned Hamas over and over again. But what I did not do was sign on to legislation that were Republican bills that were meant to cause um, anti um Anti, that were meant to fuel anti-Palestinian hate. What what we were saying was we can condemn Hamas and also uh, care about the lives of the Palestinian people and not want to see them harmed as well. So what that's what we were saying. And so uh, when they say, well, oh, you didn't do enough to support, I was talking to, to different um, rabbis saying, hey, you know, what do you need? They were saying, I, we need protection. We have, we, you know, we need more protection for at our at our synagogues. We were saying, OK, well, let's work to try to make sure that you have that. You know, um, we so we were having those conversations. And I just think that that is untrue. But in any other thing, whether, with, whether it's dealing with um, housing or anything else, people will tell us what they need. Just you have to tell us what you need. So I want to shift to abortion rights, mm-hmm. which is something that you have been very forthright during your tenure in Congress. Mm-hmm. Aaron on X asks, what does where's where does she get her info about Wesley Bell not supporting women's right to choose? Because Bell said on the show his position on abortion rights is not that much different than yours. We're the tangible difference on policy. So the the thing is this. First of all, let's start with the fact that Wesley Bell was the campaign manager for a Republican who was trying to. Uh, flip this seat, this particular seat against Lacey Clay, um, that he was the Republican campaign manager for, I believe his name was Mar- uh, Mark Byrne. Yes. He, I think he's a former Ferguson City Council. Yes, for, former Ferguson City Council member. So he was his he, he was his campaign manager. And this person was working. He wanted to have a constitutional amendment um, to ban abortion. His work was to ban abortion in Missouri. And Wesley Bell felt that it was okay to work to help flip this seat to red. He wanted to flip this seat to Republican, this particular one. Um, And so the thing is, if you are supporting and working for someone who wants a constitutional amendment to ban abortion in Missouri, then how are you, do you have the same stance as I do dating back to then? How do you we have the same stance? Because the thing is this. And I know that their spokesperson said that this was just a favor for a friend. Or he could say, like, you know, maybe his opinions changed since 2006. Like, I'll I'll, I'll bring this up. Like, your dad supported Lacey Clay in 2000, and I'm sure he didn't support Lacey Clay in 2018 or 2020. Exactly. (laughs) And so people can evolve. I've evolved in some in some areas. But when later on he continued to support Republicans as far as donating to Dean Plocker, who is the Missouri Speaker of the House. You know, um, he uh, who, by the way, is listed on the website as an election denier. Um, We but not only that, currently right now, just as I said, when you are being supported by uh, the mega donors pushing you, the biggest group that's pushing you, that is backing you, they support over 200 anti-abortion lawmakers. But then you say, I'm the same with you. No, you're not, because you know what? I am. I was. Um, I introduced bills after after Roe fell when the Dobbs decision came down. I introduced bills to make sure that the medication abortion bill was a uh, appeal was able to be uh, was able to be accessed throughout the country. I introduced bills for wraparound services for um, people who need to access abortion care and everything that goes along with that. We did that work. I was with Secretary Becerra, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, when Dobbs fell. I was sitting with him, abortion providers, storytellers, community leaders, sitting trying to figure out what we will do for Missouri. If that decision came down and in and, and which it did right there um, during that time, during during that conversation, actually, um, as someone who has had abortions, I've been public about that. I spoke at a at um, one of our congressional hearings speaking about my what happened with me and how we're, bring, we're working to make sure that we, people across this country can access abortion. And so when when Missouri, number one, we were the first state to lose access to abortion and to then feel like it's okay. We have abortion on the ballot right now. So to feel like it's okay to be supported by anti-abortion lawmakers. No, we are not the same. 
So I do want to ask this because I think it's going to certainly be brought up in the next couple of weeks. You have faced some heat because your campaign has spent money on security, including for your husband. Now, before I ask this question, we have talked interpersonally even before you were elected about the threats to you. And I imagine that they've only intensified since you've become an elected official. So I want to make that clear that the Congresswoman and I have discussed this topic at length. What do you make of the argument from people that are not fans of yours that think it's hypocritical to support the defund the police movement while paying a lot for campaign security? Right. And so they're two totally different things. That is just being uninformed or purposely ignorant. Um, You because uh, defunding the police is not about taking police from the people. It's not about making sure that, you know, uh, about removing safety from the people. It is about, again, I will say. um. We don't need to invest the dollars, the St. Louis, the St. Louis taxpayer, taxpayer dollars into militarized weaponry. Take that money and put it into the social safety net. Me having security that is paid for through the campaign is so that I can stay alive to do the work. It is not um, it is not just something that I think could happen. We have had multiple. Uh, we have had so many um, death threats that have come into our office. But not only that, like you said, Jason, you and I have had these conversations before I ever enter Congress. Um, I actually at one point went to the FBI and sat and had an interview with them and gave them all of the information of all the attempts made on my life, not just um, uh, things that people have said online, attempts made on my life. And actually, one of the people who uh, threatened me online uh, a few months before I was sworn in actually was there at the insurrection and is currently in jail for um, assaulting a police officer. And so these threats are real. We have had so the threat since I've been in the seat have been so tremendous, so much so to at one point we had to close our office, our St. Louis office. We had to evacuate it and close it for a full week. So one more question on this point, and I want to make this very clear. It is not illegal for a campaign to pay family members to be on the campaign. In fact, Lacey Clay paid his sister to do a lot of work on his campaign, and Russ Carnahan also paid his wife. But I want to ask you this directly. Can you assure voters that you have never used money from your congressional office to pay your husband for any security work. For my for my official office? Yes. Absolutely not. Never. Never once. Never once. Never once. Um, my husband has only been paid through the campaign 100 percent. And it is we have followed every applicable law. Um, to make sure that that has been handled appropriately. And the reason the the as far as the FEC is concerned, family members can work on the campaign as long as they are providing an actual service. They are doing the actual job. And that had been that has been investigated by the Office of Congressional Ethics. Um, it was a full investigation. And it, with the decision came back unanimously that there was no wrongdoing. Cori Bush is the congresswoman for Missouri's first congressional district. You can listen to Prosecutor Bell's appearance on the Politically Speaking Hour at stlpr.org. We plan on having former Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal on the program in the coming weeks. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Joining us now to discuss our interview with Congresswoman Cori Bush is Sarah Kellogg, St. Louis Public Radio State House and politics reporter. Sarah, welcome back. Hi, Jason. What were your takeaways from uh, my interview with Bush? I think one of the biggest things is, is that she really, for you, had answers to the concerns from constituents, especially talking about you spoke a lot about the um, Israel Palestine, Israel Hamas issue, and she had a lot of answers for that. I think it was she really backed up her statements, which I think was interesting to me, especially when it comes to why this is becoming an issue um, and why there has been so much opposition to her on that, why she does have two opponents. So I think that was that was an interesting takeaway for me. This is not the first time Bush has faced a challenge for re-election, but this one feels a lot more substantial, even though I would say State Senator Stephen Roberts had money and support from some Democratic officials. Why do you think this race is different than 2022? We talked a little bit about this with uh, the Bell interview, and it's it's less about her opponents more than it is about Bush herself and the circumstances. And so, you're again, you're looking at Israel Hamas. You're looking at, um, I mean, the investigation into her spending, which you guys also addressed. You're talking about just kind of a she's had more time to be a congresswoman. And so, therefore, she's getting more critiques about that. So we talked about this in the interview, but my view is if Bush retains her support in heavily African-American parts of the district, she wins. 
So I want to give some context. She averaged around 73% of the vote in five St. Louis wards with large black populations. Do you, now, we don't know the answer to this. We won't until August 7th. But do you think the onslaught of money that we talked about will be effective at reducing those margins? I'm just not sure because ultimately she is representing her constituents, which I think at least if you're looking at um, – the white progressives that are in her district, they're probably agreeing with her on her issues of Israel-Palestine. And as we talked about, we don't think that black voters care as much about this issue. So I don't know if that money, if, if it is on those particular issues, is going to sway people that much. But she did mention, and I think she's correct on this, that the ads that uh, APEC-like groups are not focusing on Israel-Gaza. Uh, they're focusing on her votes, which, by the way, her votes are totally fair game to criticize. And I think that even she would say that. But I think that's the question that I have is, is that going to move black voters away from her? I just don't I don't see it. I think that you're right. If that was such a big issue, then why aren't there ad being as many ads run about it? And then why is that the issue more on her votes and maybe her support and how the, the money that she's brought in? So I think that there isn't a clear answer as to why she's being primary other than Israel. But then why are the ads not there? You, you know, as much as I would like to not think about Joe Biden and the presidential race, like my wife is really sick of me looking at my phone and, and all that. Yeah, same here. <laughs> uh, what do you make of Bush's comments about Biden? Because there's been a lot of members of the Congressional Black Caucus who have really supported him, but she's not willing to say whether or not yet she wants him to stay or go. I mean, if she says she's listening to her constituents and, and they're wanting him to not be the nominee, wanting them to step down, as she said in the interview, I think that it's interesting that she hasn't come out with a, a comment yet, though. I think she's really... It is interesting that she's kind of waiting on this and really isn't commi committed either way. Even when you asked her, do you think he can win? She didn't really answer that question. Well, I, I've w listened to a lot of podcasts uh, more than I really care to admit. And I think the fear among Democrats is even if they think that Biden is a better candidate than, say, Vice President Kamala Harris, apparently privately nobody thinks Biden can win anymore, which is, again, something we won't know until after – you know, November. And there is a new poll out from NPR showing he's up by two points over Trump. So who knows? I think know? it's and I think it's it, it's smart of Bush to say that she's listening to her constituents and hasn't come out on that opinion yet. And and maybe, you know, if she gets more calls, it'll eventually, you know, cause her to make a statement. But for now, not really a commitment yet. So out of all the races in the St. Louis region, I think this is going to be the nastiest and most contentious do you think the outcome here could have an impact on what happens to Democrats in the fall? No, because I think the matter of abortion is a bigger deal than this particular race. I think that Democrats are going to, you know, whether their opinions are sent or Republicans who would also be in support of that initiative. I think that's a bigger issue than what would happen. I don't I think that's a bigger proponent than a deterrent of the race between Bell and and and, and Chappelle Dahl and Bush. Yeah. And I think it's possible that there could be some hurt feelings and that could lower turnout in St. Louis and St. Louis County. But again, if the abortion measure makes the ballot, th those hard feelings may dissipate because those voters want to legalize abortion. Yeah, I'm in agreement with you there. I basically just restated what yeah, you said. You did. <laughs> Sarah Kellogg is St. Louis Public Radio State House and Politics reporter. Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely. You got it. Today's episode was produced by Jason Rosenbaum. And edited by Ella Kuzis. With audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill.
and Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Thank <laughs> you.